Roughly translated, the Book of the Dead. A few years back, I started creating compilation videos of various genres, as well as genres on specific hardware. The first of these was Dreamcast Horror Games. It got a lot of feedback. Mostly positive, but some negative. It seemed to be a subject that fascinated not only me, but Sega fans everywhere. So I'd like to go back and relook at these games. We'll be reviewing the games in a bit more depth than before, as well as try to address some of the comments and criticisms I've had the chance to talk with everyone about over the past two years. In part one, we'll be looking at the games listed in the original DC Horror Games list. In part two, I'll be introducing several new games, as well as talking more about the broader subject of horror on the Dreamcast. A horror-themed amusement park, a group of high school friends fearless and eager for challenge. It's the perfect setup to a horror game. It's also a horror fan's dream. Six massive levels, each with their own theme and twist on gameplay, which will keep any horror aficionado glued to their seat for the entire ride. Ill Bleed can be compared to classic survival horror. It could also be compared to games like Deception. But it only sort of feels like these games. Really, there is nothing else like Ill Bleed. The Dreamcast got a ton of crazy ambitious games, Ill Bleed was one of the last great ones. There are some people who hate this game. To be fair, that's understandable. The game is quite slow on first impression. The tedium of having to slowly walk up and mark traps may not be every gamer's idea of a good horror. But that's the thing you have to take with a grain of salt in Ill Bleed. Horror. It has the perfect horror veneer. Buckets of blood, haunted houses, hideous monsters, and even some nudity. It's the very definition of B-horror. The question is, does B-horror have to be scary? Illbleed relies mostly on jump scares. There are several instances where you will have to dash through some sort of labyrinth while being hunted, or face a seemingly unbeatable enemy. But for the most part, Illbleed is about the imagery, the story, and the journey. The atmosphere is what makes the game into a masterpiece. Its dialogue and story are filled with jokes so inappropriate they shouldn't hit, yet they do. Illbleed had three different endings, a crazy unlockable minigame, multiple routes through, and even random rotation of traps. Though that last feature didn't work quite as well as it could have, the game is still incredibly replayable. And that's saying something as many horror games simply don't beg to be revisited in the same way Illbleed does. It may not be as well-rounded as it could have been, but Illbleed is still one of the finest horror games of all time and perfectly built for Sega's 128-bit console. Not many third-party developers took full advantage of the Dreamcast power, as it existed during an awkward gap between the PSX and PS2. Capcom, however, was one of the companies to utilize the system's power. Power Stone, Street Fighter, and yes, Code Veronica. Code Veronica effectively used the power of the DZ to craft a dark, suspenseful environment to explore. The series' leap to the next generation was also when the series really grew up. The weight of the game was heavy throughout. It wasn't just a graphical upgrade from the PlayStation, it was how these upgrades could improve the game as a whole. Fog, lighting, cinematography, facial animations, all these things came together to make Code Veronica what it is. I took some flack for this one. Perhaps I shouldn't have been so subjective with my injection of personal opinion. I started out by saying I didn't like the game, and not all of you like that. In all fairness, I did go on to state all the things the game does well. I'll say it again, I'm not suggesting Code Veronica is a bad game. It's a fantastic one. Just because you don't like a game doesn't mean you don't respect it. I didn't like the slower pace, the puzzle design, or the combat. I also didn't like how environments felt more static, having to press a button to go up or down stairs, which was something they removed for the third game. However, those are just tidbits that annoyed me. Code Veronica got way more right than it got wrong. It's a masterpiece of horror, and one of the best games you can play on the Dreamcast. Resident Evil 2 and 3 are some of the best survival horror games ever made. They solidified the formula which was used for many years to come and created a franchise synonymous with the word horror. The DC ports do these greats justice, though sadly they don't really push the envelope. Resident Evil 2 is one of the best, most replayable horror games of all time. Its multiple pathways and difficulty options cater to just about any kind of player interested in the genre. Resident Evil 3 introduced us to one of the most terrifying antagonists of all time, really dialing up the scares. The port of RE3 does have some features found in the PC version which were not included in the PSX release. Though they may not have been upgraded graphically, the games still run and control perfectly. The VMU is even put to good use, displaying your life bar. There may not be much incentive to play the DC ports of these classics if you already own them, but if you don't, hook up that VGA adapter, turn out the lights, and get ready to find out why everyone still talks about these games.
Oh man, what a train wreck. The Ring was a perfect urban legend. The game could have been a great extension of the universe. Having players explore the world of the Ring would no doubt bring an uneasy tension delighting any adrenaline junkie who dared enter. Unfortunately, that's not what we got at all. <laughs> Mega's just lost her boyfriend, though you wouldn't know it because she has a great big dumb smile painted across her face the whole game. The story starts with you taking control of her and entering the lab where your former partner worked. Soon things go into lockdown, you are left to investigate on your own. Everything up to this point actually works okay, you walk around, gather items, collect clues, and talk to other workers. It's not unlike a standard point and click adventure game. You can even change the camera to fixed first or third person. That however soon becomes a problem. Unlike a point and click game or a visual novel, you have to run all over the base of many repeating corridors and identical looking rooms waiting for doors to slowly open while areas load. The complex seems daunting at first glance, you may wonder what horrors lurk in the labyrinth of rooms. You'll soon find the only thing to fear is boredom. Almost all of the rooms are empty. Without a guide, you'll be wandering aimlessly for hours finding that one person or item you need to move on. But that's only half the game. The other half is where you go into the ring game world, oh yeah, the ring is now a video game, and shoot monkeys hiding in the dark. Surprisingly, these sections can actually be pretty frightening. However, since the controls and shooting mechanics are so bad, any sort of enjoyment you may have had will be lost. It tries to copy Resident Evil with its item management and combat. It tries to copy Silent Hill with its light system and atmosphere. It fails horribly at both. All in all, the game is playable. If you're up for a challenge or secretly like bad games, give it a go. Warp was one of those companies who never was afraid to try something new. Kenji Anno and his team could take a single concept, focus gameplay around it, and tell an unforgettable tale. Real Sound was a sort of visual novel without any visuals. Enemy Zero was a horror game which asked you to rely on your ears instead of your eyes. D2 is a bit of a misguided title, as it really doesn't have anything to do with the original game. Instead, it continues the tradition of using Warp's digital cast. However, it's not just the faces which will be familiar to fans who have been following Warp since their incarnation. D2 is a sort of conglomeration or pinnacle of Warp's crazy sub experimentation. It's the finest game they ever made, and one of the most haunting survival horror games of all time. Stranded in the Canadian North, Laura Parton struggles to regain her memory. Aided by an unlikely cast of characters forced into a hopeless situation, Laura must discover how to survive in the cold landscape. She will also find there is more than mad science happening here. Her destiny is one of tragedy and heroism. Combining first-person, on-rails adventure tropes, arcade-style shooting, RPG leveling, hunting and marksmanship, and an encyclopedia of cryptic narration, D2 is one massive game. Though it does span 4 GD ROMs, much of the game is spent viewing cinematics. Production values all around are quite stellar considering when this game came out. If the gameplay had been balanced a bit better with the in-game movies, this would be an easy recommendation. The hunting level, grinding, and resource management just don't seem as fleshed out as they could have. D2 was Warp's last game. It's one any horror fan should play through at least once, just be prepared to sit idle for long lengths of time. Alone in the Dark is viewed by many as the grandfather of survival horror. Games copied its formula for a long time, though strangely it disappeared for a while just when the genre seemed to be taking off. When it made its return, many agreed it had been worth the wait. Coming to the PSX, PS2, PC, Game Boy Color, and yes, the Dreamcast in 2001, the new Nightmare was a long-awaited fourth entry in the series. It took a lot of what made the original game so memorable, while at the same time taking cues from the genre as it had evolved over the past nine years. You had dual vantage points to play the game from. You had smoother, more refined controls as well as performance. Yet it still maintained its core formula of being a horror game first and an action game second. Running from enemies was often a beneficial way to deal with confrontation. The puzzles laid throughout the island were clever and well-conceived, making progress a gratifying but uneasy experience. Great sound design, lighting effects, and story made the new nightmare a delight to play. The DC version was built rather well for the hardware, making it feel like a then-next-generation game. Even today, it still holds up as one of the best classic horror games in this style. He awoke something dark in the woods. It wasn't a bad idea, adapting one of horror's most respected cult franchises into a video game. It could have action, horror, and comedy all wrapped together. 
Evil Dead Hail to the King did try. It had an entertaining story, even if it was just a regurgitation of the Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness arc. It had a one-liner button, great for cooling down after a tense fight. It even had some decent jump scares. The level design and pacing aren't even that bad. You get to explore the Nolby's cabin and surrounding woods in a way never before seen. The game gets just about everything right, except two major aspects, the controls and combat. Combat is too fast and demanding for the type of fixed camera gameplay present. It's also way too easy to run low on gas for your chainsaws, as well as ammo for your guns, seeing as enemies constantly respawn. Controls, especially on the Dreamcast, are very loose. It takes a long while to get used to the flighty and oversensitive input. If you're an Evil Dead fan and happen to have a Game Shark, then the game isn't too bad for one playthrough. For everyone else, only gamers seeking crazy, unfair challenge need apply. It's happening. It's happening in a big way. Now, if you'll excuse me. The reason this game was included, and not House of the Dead 2 on the original list, is because of Death Crimson OX's story mode. This mode has you choose different paths, dealing with the drama of the situation as you would in a normal survival horror game. Death Crimson OX isn't really a good game, rather it's an interesting experiment in combining a longer, story-focused campaign with on-rails light gun action, an idea which would be revisited in later games such as Resident Evil Dead AIM. Death Crimson OX isn't really a showcase of the DC's graphical abilities, nor does it tell a very engaging story. Nor does it have the refined and exciting shooting of House of the Dead 2. There isn't really much of a reason to play this game unless you have a light gun. Otherwise, it gets boring very quickly. <laughs> Why is it zombies are scary? In video games, it's most often because there are so many of them. If they manage to corner you, it's game over. However, on their own, zombies aren't really much of a threat. Capcom's Dino Crisis takes the best aspects of Resident Evil's design and swaps the hordes of brainless dead with packs of killer angry dinosaurs. Here, you have no upper hand. Dinosaurs are better suited for this type of situation than you are. Surviving Dino Crisis is not a right. The game's difficulty amplifies its terror, making it one of the most horrifying games of the era. Like Resident Evil 2 and 3, Dino Crisis did not receive any graphical updates when ported over. However, that doesn't mean the game isn't enjoyable. This is one of the most hardcore survival horror games in existence. Without turning to the supernatural or occult, Dino Crisis manages to keep you on your toes through sheer intimidation and jump scares. Blue Stinger's dinosaurs are a bit different. Matter of fact, it's hard to classify the game's enemies as dinosaur or zombie. The plot revolves around Elliot Blod, a search and rescue worker who is finally taking a long deserved vacation. He, very stupidly, decides to go to the vacation spot known as Dinosaur Island. This island emerged from the ocean in the early 2000s. It was the point of impact where the meteor hit which wiped out the dinosaurs millions of years ago. Now, alien life has come to the island and blocked off all outside contacts that it may hunt down and destroy the revived dinosaur threat which is for some reason most prevalent at the point of impact. The plot makes no sense, but it doesn't have to thanks to some crazy funny dialogue and lip-syncing. Tell me your location, Elliot. All I can tell you is that I'm by a pier. Though you do scavenge for items and ammo like your vanilla survival horror game, Blue Stinger often puts the responsibility on the player to prepare for upcoming encounters. Many of the game's enemies drop money when defeated, as they were once inhabitants of the island. These enemies respawn, allowing you to farm money. Money is then spent in vending machines on new gear or equipment. Think Resident Evil 4. You can also access bank accounts, find secret areas, and discover all manner of secrets while exploring the island. While not quite open world, you can travel back to many different parts of the island as you progress through the story. Elliot. Janine. Though the graphics leave something to be desired, the music is phenomenal, making the game feel like a large-budget action epic. 
Blue Stinger is a fantastic action game that, despite some control issues, has aged very well. Carrier brings some great new improvements to the genre, though it isn't without its faults. Taking place on a gigantic aircraft carrier, you enter as either Jack Ingalls or Jessifer Manning. This standard rescue mission soon turns into something much more. A deadly parasitic plant life form has infected a large number of crew. What follows is your standard Resident Evil clone, but with a few clever improvements. Uh, what is that? For one, you can see the target of your weapon as you aim. This allows you to strategically take enemies down. The environments are also rendered in real time, unlike the classic REs. This allows you to view them in first person as well as have the camera pan and zoom as you walk about the ship. Carrier looked quite good, and it was nice to see a third party exclusive really push boundaries. However, even with all its clever mechanics, Carrier isn't a very scary game. It lacks the jump scares or psychological tension of other DC horror games. The story is also very predictable, making it hard to get attached to anyone. Though its atmosphere is so well built, fans should have no problem seeing both characters' campaigns to the end. Exclusive to Japan, Seven Mansions tried something very bold and brave, having two players play simultaneously in a horror game. It worked pretty well, too. Puzzles could be solved by both players if playing side by side, sometimes forcing players to rely on one another. Yet the game was also very playable solo. It was a neat idea. Getting to explore the mansion with a friend was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, the game didn't really do anything exceptional. You could change the viewpoint from first to third or even fix. The combat was your standard auto-aim fair, though you could strafe about while fighting. Seven Mansions was more of a novelty than a must-play, though if you know Japanese and have a friend who is as into survival horror as you are, give it a try. It's no worse than Resident Evil 6, right? That wraps up part 1. I hope you enjoyed revisiting this fascinating library of horror games. I also hope I cleared up some of the comments from the original video. Once again, I'm not saying Code Veronica is a bad game. In part 2, we're going to look at several other DC games which aren't straight up horror, but still bring a unique sort of terror. Stay tuned. survival horror. It could also be compared to games like Deception. But it only sort of feels like these games. Really, there is nothing else like Ill Bleed. The Dreamcast got a ton of crazy ambitious games. Ill Bleed was one of the last great ones. There are some people who hate this game. To be fair, that's understandable. The game is quite slow on first impression. The tedium of having to slowly walk up and mark traps may not be every gamer's idea of a good horror. But that's the thing you have to take with a grain of salt in Ill Bleed. Horror. It has the perfect horror veneer, buckets of blood, haunted houses, hideous monsters, and even some nudity. It's the very definition of B-horror. The question is, does B-horror have to be scary? Ill Bleed relies mostly on jump scares. There are several instances where you will have to dash through some sort of labyrinth while being hunted, or face a seemingly unbeatable enemy. But for the most part, Ill Bleed is about the imagery, the story, and the journey. The atmosphere is what makes the game into a masterpiece. Its dialogue and story are filled with jokes so inappropriate they shouldn't hit, yet they do. Ill Bleed had three different endings, a crazy unlockable minigame, multiple routes through, and even ran much incentive to play the DC ports of these classics you already own them. But if you don't, hook up that VGA adapter, turn out the lights, and get ready to find out why everyone still talks about these games. Oh man, what a train wreck. The Ring was a perfect urban legend. The game could have been a great extension of the universe. Having players explore the world of the Ring would no doubt bring an uneasy tension delighting any adrenaline junkie who dared enter. Unfortunately, that's not what we got at all. <laughs> Meg has just lost her boyfriend, though you wouldn't know it because she has a great big dumb smile painted across her face the whole game. 
The story starts with you taking control of her and entering the lab where your former partner worked. Soon things go into lockdown. You are left to investigate on your own. Everything up to this point actually works okay. You walk around, gather items, collect clues, and talk to other workers. It's not unlike a standard point-and-click adventure game. You can even change the camera to fixed first or third person. That, however, soon becomes a problem. Unlike a point-and-click game or a visual novel, you have to run all over the base of many repeating corridors and identical-looking rooms waiting for the rotation of traps. Though that last feature didn't work quite as well as it could have, the game is still incredibly replayable. And that's saying something as many horror games simply don't beg to be revisited in the same way Obleed does. It may not be as well-rounded as it could have been, but Obleed is still one of the finest horror games of all time and perfectly built for Sega's 128-bit console. Not many third-party developers took full advantage of the Dreamcast power, as it existed during an awkward gap between the PSX and PS2. Capcom, however, was one of the companies to utilize the system's power. Power Stone, Street Fighter, and yes, Code Veronica. Code Veronica effectively used the power of the DZ to craft a dark, suspenseful environment to explore. The series' leap to the next generation was also when the series really grew up. The weight of the game was heavy throughout. It wasn't just a graphical upgrade from the PlayStation, it was how these upgrades could improve the game as a whole. Fog, lighting, cinematography, facial animations, all these things came together to make Code Veronica what it is. I took some flack for this one. Perhaps I shouldn't have been so subjective with my injection of personal opinion. I started out by saying I didn't like the game, and not all of you like that. In all fairness, I did go on to state all the things the game does well. I'll say it again, I'm not suggesting Code Veronica is a bad game. It's a fantastic one. Just because you don't like a game doesn't mean you don't respect it. I didn't like the slower pace, the puzzle design, or the combat. I also didn't like how environments felt more static having to press a button to go up or down stairs, which was something they removed for the third game. However, those are just tidbits that annoyed me. Code Veronica got way more right than it got wrong. It's a masterpiece of horror, and one of the best games you can play on the Dreamcast. Resident Evil 2 and 3 are some of the best survival horror games ever made. They solidified the formula which was used for many years to come and created a franchise synonymous with the word horror. The DC ports do these greats justice, though sadly they don't really push the envelope. Resident Evil 2 is one of the best, most replayable horror games of all time. Its multiple pathways and difficulty options cater to just about any kind of player interested in the genre. Resident Evil 3 introduced us to one of the most terrifying antagonists of all time, really dialing up the scares. The port of RE3 does have some features found in the PC version which were not included in the PSX release. Though they may not have been upgraded graphically, the games still run and control perfectly. The VMU is even put to good use displaying your life bar. There may not be Roughly translated, the book of the dead. A few years back, I started creating compilation videos of various genres as well as genres on specific hardware. The first of these was Dreamcast Horror Games. It got a lot of feedback. Mostly positive, but some negative. It seemed to be a subject that fascinated not only me, but Sega fans everywhere. So I'd like to go back and relook at these games. We'll be reviewing the games in a bit more depth than before, as well as try to address some of the comments and criticisms I've had the chance to talk with everyone about over the past two years. In part one, we'll be looking at the games listed in the original DC Horror Games list. In part two, I'll be introducing several new games, as well as talking more about the broader subject of horror on the Dreamcast. A horror-themed amusement park, a group of high school friends fearless and eager for challenge. It's the perfect setup to a horror game. It's also a horror fan's dream. Six massive levels, each with their own theme and twist on gameplay, which will keep any horror aficionado glued to their seat for the entire ride. Illbleed can be compared to classic